is it true that how we say something is at least as important as what we say? So we're going to do a little experiment. Now, for those of you online with us, it's going to be a little challenging, but all of our campuses right now, I know you can do this. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to find somebody next to you. I want you to lean over and say, I am so happy to see you here right now. Now, some of y'all, some of you couples, you just had a romantic moment. I mean, it's touching. I mean, you, you might actually go out on a, on a date after this moment. You might be able to have a little Sabbath after the service. Um, that, that'd be awesome. For others of you, maybe, um, maybe you're about to get in trouble. Some of you husbands, you didn't say it the right way. And your wife is reminding you right now, see, told you so. And uh, some parent is kind of squeezing their, their kid right now. And they're like, hey. Or maybe, maybe you're one of those kids and you're like, oh, I'm so happy to see you here right now. <laughs> and maybe, maybe you're sitting next to somebody. Maybe you're brand new coming in to life. You're like, this is the moment that I most don't want to be part of. I don't want anybody to talk to me. I don't want somebody to say, it's so nice to see you here. And, and here's the deal. We know that it's true that the way you say something is at least as important as uh, what you're actually saying, the words that are coming out of your mouth. And so, you know, you could say, I love you. You could say, it's good to see you. You can say, hey, how are you doing? And the way you say it is probably more important than the words coming out of your mouth. And th this creates some challenges in my home. So I'm just going to kind of give you a quick like peek into our world. I would say one of the top issues for Laura and I in parenting our kids is the way they say things. They could say the right thing, but if they say it the wrong way, we're pretty upset. There, is it true that there is a right way to ask? Is there a right way to interrupt us? Is there a right way to apologize? Like if we say, okay, that's it. You need to say you're sorry. I'm sorry. You're like, no, you don't actually mean it. Of course I don't mean it. You just told me I had to say I'm sorry. We're like, ah, okay, so we got to talk about this, right? We got to explain to you why you, I'm going to make you sorry. <laughs> I'll make you feel sorry. All right, so here's the deal, right? So we, we have to teach them why they should feel sorry, and then that there is a right way and a wrong way to say I'm sorry. There is a right way and a wrong way to interrupt, and so with my little guys, this is really important because they have zero patience. I mean, they will run up and just tackle my leg as a way to interrupt. And then they'll just stand there, daddy, 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 daddy. I mean, it just, I have discovered these kids have an endless supply of um, focus. Like they are intent on getting what they want. I'm telling you, if my boys keep that for the rest of their life, they're going to be super successful because they can focus and they're not going to let up until they get it. And I'm like, so I've literally had to stop and talk to my boys. You do not just walk up and interrupt me when I'm talking with adults. Some of, poor, poor you, some of you have been around me when my kids are running up to me and they, they don't care who's around. Daddy, 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 daddy. And they're going to interrupt anything and everything. And sometimes I have to talk to them and say, hey, you can run up, you can grab my sleeve, you can grab my leg. And, you, and if you pull on it, I'll know you're there. And if I, if I, you wait until I acknowledge you. Okay, so you th might think I'm old fashioned. Because I think that w the way you say something is at least as important as what you're saying. And so maybe for you, like me, that's true in your home. Maybe for some of you in your parenting, that's been true. Or maybe in your relationship with your parents. Maybe for you, that's caused some trouble at work. Or maybe in romance, or in friendships. And if, if there's a right way to say it, not just what you're saying, but how you're saying it, and that's true in parenting, it's true in our relationships, if that's true at work, is it possible that it's also true in our relationship with God? Now, for some of you, this is going to lean into the most stereotypical thoughts you have about God. For you, you're like, yeah, how I approach God. Ugh, I don't even, I'm scared to talk to God. So here's what I want you to do. You're going to participate with me in this message. And so here's what I want you to just pause for a moment. And I want you to immediately think, what is the picture you have of God in your mind? You could even, you could even just close your eyes for a moment. 
right now, all of our campuses, I just want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to think of what is the picture that you have of God? Maybe for some of you, you see God as a judge. And you're just, you just think he's waiting to crush you. He's waiting to catch you doing something wrong. Maybe for you, God is a police officer. Or maybe God is cruel. He's a cruel boss or master for others of you. Maybe God is just far away. He's like an absent father. He left you. He abandoned you for others of you. Maybe God's just not there at all. Well, then how you see God is going to be really important to how you approach God in prayer. By the way, you can open your eyes again. Um, I want you to hold on to that picture, though, of how you see God. Certainly, how we see God is going to affect how we approach God in prayer. And so let's talk about this. Jesus had a group of really close, close friends that followed him. They stayed with him. They were, they were his students, and they were referred to as his disciples. And there's these really incredible moments. I mean, there's a moment where Jesus is asleep in the boat, and there's this huge storm. They wake him up, and they're like, Jesus, don't you care that we're all about to die in this storm? And Jesus wakes up. He calms the storm. And you know what's crazy? None of them stop and go like, wow, teach us how to calm storms. There's another moment where Jesus raises a dead girl back to life. And none of his followers go, hey, Jesus, teach us how to raise people from the dead. There was one time that his friends asked him to teach them how he did what he did. And it wasn't when he turned water to wine, although that would be cool. Um, it wasn't when he fed thousands and thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and fish. It wasn't when he raised the dead or healed the sick or gave sight to the blind or healed the lame man's legs. Interestingly, there is this one time when his closest friends and followers watch him do something and they go like this, teach us how to do that. We want what you have. Now, if it were me, I don't know. I think healing, uh, healing people would be pretty cool. Raising dead people would be pretty amazing. I'd be like, Jesus, give me that. Like, I want the tricks of the trade. The only, thing Jesus, the only thing his friends ask him is this. We're going to jump into the gospel according to Luke, and he captures this moment. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. What? Of all of the things his closest friends, his followers, his students asked him to teach them, not how to raise the dead or heal the sick or feed the hungry or clothe the naked or do amazing miracles. They said, Jesus, teach us how to pray the way you pray. Now, this, this, there's a little statement here that might catch your attention, just as John taught his disciples. So here's the deal. Jesus and all of his closest students, they were young Jewish men who grew up being taught how to pray. That's right. For, for the last, you know, for uh, thousands of years, Jewish boys have been taught to memorize prayers. There's rituals to prayer. There, there's devotion to prayer. There's, they, they, they learn memorized prayers. They learn how to pray, like the posture of prayer that even today, maybe you, you might be aware that some of the most devout people when it comes to prayer are Jewish people. Maybe you've heard of the wailing wall where they will, they will put on a head covering. They will go to the wall. Laura and I had the privilege of being in Israel and got a chance to go to the wailing wall. They expect the women to cover their heads. Men have to wear a head covering. And when you go, it's an incredibly solemn place. And, and uh, some of them will scribble down a prayer and they'll put it in the, in the crevices of the wall. And they go there and it's a very sobering place. And so for thousands of years, young Jewish men have been taught how to pray and the prayers to pray. And they've been memorizing prayers. And so Jesus was taught how to pray. Well, about 200 years before Jesus was born, uh, the Jewish uh, religion, they, they introduced, the rabbis and teachers introduced a new way to pray. They actually scripted out an outline. It had about 18 stanzas, or like, another way to say it, like 18 prayer points. And, and each prayer point had like a script that went with it. And so they were, they were taught to memorize each of those 18 stanzas. And if you were really religious, you pray through the whole thing. But if you're anything like me, when you sit down over a meal, you don't want the person in your family that prays really long to pray over your food. Like, this is Thanksgiving. I want to eat. 
Jesus, thank you for the food. Amen. Right? Like, and, and so if you call on one of your kids that they're really devout and they start praying, and I'm like impatient. I'm the worst dad because I'm like, hey, can you like hurry it up? Like I'll start squeezing my kids' hands, like, hey, I want to eat, you know? But but like that was they like they had these 18 things. And so here's what they would do: they would go to their rabbi and like, can you give us the short version? And so every teacher in Jewish tradition had like an abbreviated version of those 18 stanzas. It was actually kind of like a common thing that they did. And so John offered his followers a shortened version. And so now Jesus' disciples, they're watching Jesus and they're like, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. But this was different because what they saw in Jesus was unique and different than the way all the other teachers taught to pray. And so they say, Jesus, you teach us how to pray. But before Jesus gives them the script, he gives some backstory. He goes, before I teach you the words to say, I want to teach you why you say it. And so it's recorded in Matthew chapter six, where you kind of get to the heart of what Jesus is explaining. He says, so when you pray, he goes, before I teach you the prayer, He goes, let's talk about your heart. Let's talk about your motives. Let's talk about how you say things, not just what you say. Because how you say them is more important than what you're actually saying. So he goes, so when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. The word hypocrite in, in this time really just meant an actor. Don't be like actors on a stage performing. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. He talks about how, what reward were they looking for? They were praying to be seen. They were praying to be heard, not seen by God and heard by God, but seen by others and heard by others. He goes, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And then he concludes with this. So he challenges them. And when you pray, Don't keep on babbling like the pagans, meaning they were pagan, right? Like, don't just babble nonsense like people who don't even believe in God. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you even ask him. This then is how you should pray. And then from this point, he's going to give what you commonly know as the Lord's Prayer. Well, it's not the Lord's prayer, right? It's the prayer the Lord gave as a model prayer for us. But before he gives the prayer, he gives an explanation. And in essence, he's getting to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is this. If if you're anything like me, sometimes you worry. You worry if you actually know how to pray. You're worried that maybe you're not saying the right words long enough And, and when you do pray, maybe it sounds awkward or you're a little worried that like when people hear you, they think like you don't really know how, you don't know how to pray. You don't have the right things to say. And maybe you feel like your prayer life could use a boost. All right. You want, you want to know the first key principle of boosting your prayer life? It's this. Motives matter. I want to encourage you. We take a moment, write that down. Maybe pull out your smartphone or tablet and just type that in. Or go old fashioned, pull out a pen and just write this down. Motives matter. That's right. Believe it or not. What you say is not as important as how you say it. Jesus is teaching. He's saying, look, the the why is more important than the what. Motives matter. Now, here here is our challenge. Sometimes with my kids, they have a little attitude. And and sometimes they get a little frustrated. they, They start to question if mommy and daddy are really listening. If mommy and daddy really care. If mommy and daddy even noticed what they were walking through. And that comes out with a little bit of attitude. And maybe you're feeling the same way. And so sometimes, because you're not even sure God's listening, your prayers have become routine. You've just memorized prayers and they've become a ritual. And and some of you, you don't even know if there even is a God or if God's even there. And so you pray, but your prayers are more like just pie in the sky wishes. You're just kind of throwing it up there because you're like, I don't even know if he's there. So, you know, maybe God, like whatever. And then others, you've had some tough moments with God. And so your, your prayers come out with a little bit of an attitude, a little bit of an edge. And often the reason why our prayers come out with a bad attitude 
or they're, they're like pie in the sky because we're not even sure if there really is a God that's theirs because we have a broken relationship with God. Something is not right. And what's not right in our relationship with God is something Jesus referred to commonly as sin. Sin is deep inside of us. This isn't the stuff anybody sees, right? Like you can see when somebody sometimes has a bad attitude. In fact, sometimes with my, my uh, kids, I have to stop and say that, that right there, that was the attitude I'm talking about. Because they don't sometimes realize they have a bad attitude. And so sometimes I say, see, the way you said that, that was the attitude. Okay, we don't always see it. And so Jesus is teaching, he says it's sin. Sin is a spiritual problem inside of us that fractures our relationship with God. And when it fractures our relationship with God, it leaves us separated from God. It's like giving God the stiff arm. And sin stirs desires that lead to decisions that produce behavior that drives us further and further away from God so that even when we pray, even when we talk to God, it's as if we don't really believe God's even there, as if God's even listening. And Jesus came, let me be really clear, Jesus came not to teach us about prayer. Jesus came to resolve a much greater crisis. He came to address that issue right there, that sin problem that actually separates us from God. The reason why we lean into religion and ritual is because we try to manufacture relationship with God and we hope that by talking a lot with God, if we use a lot of words, that somehow those prayers will get through And so Jesus goes, no, no, you don't have to spend your whole life using rituals and religion to get to God. I have come to rescue you and bring you into relationship with God. How did he do that? Well, he dealt with the sin problem. The only way to deal with the sin problem was for Jesus to die. Because sin doesn't just separate us from God. It leads to a life of ruin headed toward forever judgment. And so what Jesus does is he comes to earth. God bridges the gap between us and him. He enters into our world. He, He comes in a close proximity with us to spend time with us, to take our sin problem on himself. So that when Jesus died, he died in our place. He died the death we deserved. He took on our eternal death sentence so that when he died, he died once for all. So that anyone who believes in Jesus by faith is forgiven of sin. But Jesus didn't just die. He rose from the dead and in his resurrection, he frees us from the grip of sin. He liberates us from the fear of death and eternal judgment because when we believe in Jesus, we're not only forgiven, we're given new life because God's spirit, which was far from us, because of sin. God's spirit enters into us. Now, I know that sounds a little weird, a little mysterious. Okay, let me make it really simple. There's an eternal part of you. This is the part of you that lives forever. This is the part of you that you know you were designed to last forever. When you believe in Jesus by faith, God's spirit, which is eternal and invisible, enters into your spirit. And he brings his love and his life. He brings relationship with him. See, Jesus came to earth. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead to give us relationship, not religion. The goal in prayer is not some ritualistic religious ceremony, but to have relationship with God. So now with that in mind, let me jump back in and let me teach you how to pray. Not the words to say, but the heart behind it. So let's jump back in, right? Jesus is teaching and he says this, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. All right, what's the point? The best Posture of prayer is simply a pure heart. Would you take a moment and just write that down? But I hope more than writing it down, that kind of sticks in your heart. So I'm going to explain to you what I mean. In in this ancient time when Jesus is alive, 
The religious leaders actually would have debates and arguments about the right way to pray. And they, they would talk about, like, do you have to, like the most religious people, they lay down when they pray. They put their face on the ground, they stretch out their arms, and they, they lay like this, and they pray. Because certainly the closer you are to the ground, the more humble you are, the more God would hear you. Others would argue that you have to have your head covered not wearing a baseball cap because God forbid you did that, but you know, maybe putting a, a prayer blanket over your head or something like this, right? And others would say, you gotta keep your eyes closed because if you're looking around, of course, now you're not paying attention to God. You're paying attention to whatever's happening around you. And if you're like me, you're gonna be super distracted. And I fall into this trap sometimes too. When we, when we pray over our meal, we all take hands and my little guys, they have an attention span of about three seconds. And so they know they're supposed to close their eyes. And so they open their eyes about two, two, three seconds later. And of course, I have to open my eyes to check on them. And so I open my eyes and be like, hey, close your eyes. And then they're looking at me like, I'm confused. Am I supposed to have my eyes open or closed? Because you have yours open, right? And so we fall into this trap because we don't know. Here's the deal. Jesus is teaching us, no, no, no. If you're worried about whether you're laying down or kneeling down or your eyes are open, your eyes are closed, or your, is your head covered, is your head not covered, you missed the point. You totally miss the point. Believe it or not, I'm going to blow some of your minds. It doesn't matter whether your eyes are closed. God will not hear, he'll hear you any more or less whether your eyes are open or closed. And some of you right now, you're like, <gasps> Patrick's a heretic. <laughs> it don't matter whether you're kneeling down or standing up or going for a jog or on a Ferris wheel. Some of y'all, man, I've been on Ferris wheels. I pray better when I'm on a Ferris wheel. I'm like, dear God, I hate those things. Put me on a crazy fast roller coaster. I, I don't even need to pray. But you put me on a Ferris wheel, I feel like I'm about to meet God. Here's the deal. It's not the posture of your physical body that matters. What God cares about is the heart, a pure heart. A heart that is sincere before him. A heart that is not focused on putting on a show for others to see and hear. A heart that is more concerned about impressing God than impressing others. But not impressing God by sounding good. Here's what they believe because they're hypocrites. They believe that if they looked good, they had the right posture, and they sounded good, they said the right kind of words, that God would think they're good and then God would answer their prayer. They were very formulaic. And Jesus is coming along saying, uh-uh, you got your reward if you're praying for others to notice. In fact, what I want you to realize when you come to God in prayer is, it doesn't matter about how you're physically positioned. It matters about the posture of your heart. And what God is impressed with is a sincere and pure heart. You're not coming to God to manipulate God. You're not coming to God to use God. Like one of my kids coming to me, you're not running to God to demand your way with a bad attitude. You're coming to God in humility. So is my heart pop, uh, broken before the Lord? Is my heart sincere before the Lord? Is my heart focused on God in prayer? It doesn't matter when my eyes are open or closed. Is my heart open to God in prayer? Here's the deal. I want to challenge you with something. Learn to practice the art of secrecy. I don't mean keeping secrets. I mean the habit of the secret place. In a marriage relationship, there are, there are things that are meant to be private. That you don't need to talk about with anybody else. It's not anybody else's business. Now, when kids come along, it kind of becomes obvious, right? I thought y'all would laugh. Okay. <laughs> there are things that are meant to be intimate and private and kept private. In my relationship with God, prayer is deeply intimate. And it's meant to be done in the secret place. It doesn't matter who's around. Right now, you could have a secret place moment with God in the midst of a room full of people. Because it's about your heart focused on God and it's staying secret. I mean, I don't need to tell everybody what I'm praying about. I don't need to talk about my prayer life. I don't need to do it for everyone else to notice. I am focused on simply God noticing. And what God notices is a pure heart. So my, my challenge to you is... What is done in secret, does it match what others see? Because God cares more about your motives than your methods. He cares more about your heart than even the habit of prayer.
It's not the formula. It's not the words. It's not the ritual. It's the heart sincerely turning to God and wanting to have conversation with God, right? So prayer is not a parade of words. It's a deeply personal conversation. Okay, now let's jump back in and let's learn actually how Jesus taught us to pray. So here it is, Matthew chapter six, verse nine. This is how Jesus then opens the prayer. He goes, this then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. There it is. I just gave you the secret sauce to prayer. Jesus just handed you something remarkable. So let me, let me unpack this for you because you might be like, wait, what? Is Patrick just over-exaggerating? Believe it or not, there is something, there's a few things that are really powerful here and I wanna break them down for you. The key is this. Not only is the best posture of prayer a pure heart, but the best direction of prayer is to our heavenly father. Would you make a note of that? The direction of your prayer is to our heavenly father. Let's, um, let's talk about this for a moment. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Believe it or not, even though I said that prayer is deeply personal, it's intimate like something that happens in a marriage relationship, prayer is actually best meant to be shared. You actually best pray together. Listen to how Jesus opens it. He goes, our Father in heaven, He didn't say my father in heaven. He says our father in heaven. In essence, you you can have a secret moment with God in prayer together with others who are also having a secret moment with God in prayer. We actually pray better when we're praying together with others. We're cheering each other on. We're encouraging each other. We're not doing it for each other. We're not trying to impress each other. But there is something like... There's something challenging and motivating and encouraging when we come to God and we say, our Father in heaven. There's there's another lesson in this. Jesus is also saying that prayer is not for your personal preferences. You don't get to go to God and say, God, this is what I want and list all your little personal preferences. I'm not saying we don't pray for our needs. I'm not saying that we don't put our desires before the Lord. But there is something powerful about saying, God, our Father in heaven. Meaning, there is a, an aspect of prayer that is, God, this is what's going on in our community. This is what's going on in our lives. And God, I'm lifting up those needs to you. All right, so when we come to God as our Father. The other powerful thing about this is Jesus saying this. He's going, um, our means that it's not exclusive to just a few religious people. Jesus says, our father means there's an open invitation. Anyone with a pure heart, anyone who comes to God with the right attitude, God becomes their father. He's saying, our father. This was mind-blowing in a Jewish religious culture that they were like, no, 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 you've got to say it the right way. You've got to look the right way. You've got to act the right way. And Jesus is like, "Uh uh-uh. Anybody who comes and says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You have access to God. You have have immediate access. Now, let's keep going. He says, our Father in heaven. Check this out. This is gonna, hopefully this blows your mind. This was revolutionary because they did not talk about God as Father. In fact, for thousands of years of history, thousands of years of prayers, there are very rarely moments where the people in the nation of Israel ever refer to God as Father. And anytime they did, it was only referring to God as the Father over a nation or over nations, like, like God is the Father of our nation, right? But Jesus 60 times refers to God as Father, and to religious leaders, that was offensive. They, they said to him, who do you think you are? How dare you refer to God as your father? Are you suggesting that you're his son? Yes. Not only am I saying I'm the son of God, but I've come to invite you to become sons and daughters of God. And so I'm going to teach you to pray, Father in heaven. This is powerful. This is revolutionary. Now, I realize some of you, you, had a, you have a very positive feelings when you think about saying, Father. You, you have a great relationship with dad or you did have a great relationship with dad. And so using terms like dad or daddy or father, that, that feels really good. Others of you, maybe not so much. You thinking about God as father is painful. It, it invokes uh, deep emotional hurt. Maybe it brings with it some past sorrow, some regret, some shame. And so I want to talk with you for a moment. The the lesson here is this. Don't focus on prayer. Focus on the Father. 
Some of you all, you're having a difficulty in prayer because you're too focused on the words and the prayers. Just focus on the Father. But for those of you that you get stuck on this idea of God being Father, I want you to think about it. Imagine a child that's been abused or abandoned or neglected. We have a tough time hearing this idea of God being Father. And a man comes into that child's life, a genuinely caring, kind man and says, I love you, I choose you, I am going to adopt you, and I'm gonna love you no matter what you ever do, I'm gonna love you, and I'm gonna be here for you, and I'm gonna be faithful to you, and I'm gonna care for you no matter whatever happens in your life. Now, it might not happen overnight, but, you, but that father keeps being present and keeps loving and keeps caring. It's gonna win that child's heart over time. And eventually, that child's gonna love the sound of saying, Daddy, So now I want you to picture, I want to picture you running into the lap of daddy. And he puts you in his arms, a loving daddy, a caring daddy, puts you in his arms, he sits you on his lap, and he says, it's so good to see you, sweetheart. How you doing? And here's your response. You go, daddy, I love you so much. And you have to know that I, I think the world of you. That's literally how Jesus opened the prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hey, Daddy, I just want you to know that I think the world of you. I have the greatest respect for you. My kids, we don't don't always see eye to eye. Well, I'm not not a perfect daddy by any stretch of the imagination, but there are moments when I get home and my little boys run up to me and they don't ask. They grab my my hands, they go, Daddy, let's wrestle. And they're pulling me. I got a backpack on my back. I, I got my, you know, my church, you know, my work clothes on. And I'm like, I'm not ready. And you know what I do? I'm not going to blow them off. I'm going to go running into the living room and I'm going to fall on the floor and we're going to play together, right? Sometimes my girls, I, I got other things on my mind. Like, Daddy, we need to talk for a moment. I, I've learned, you, you want to learn how to pray? Don't watch religious people pray. Don't go to church to learn how to pray. Watch kids who know that they have a dad that adores them. That's how you learn to pray. And when you pray, you say, Father, hallowed. It simply means holy. Holy is the essence of who God is. It means that God is perfect with no blemishes. Holy means that God is all light with no darkness. It means that God is all good with no evil. God isn't the yin and the yang thing. God, there's not a little bit of good in every evil and a little bit of evil and all good. No, no, no. God is all good. He is only light. He is only pure. And so the word holy means, Jesus said, I come to God the Father and I say, Father, you are above all else. You are perfect. You are holy. You are righteous. You are always faithful. You always do what is good. And now I want to talk to you. So this is the moment when we tell our kids, that was a wrong attitude. I am not your friend. I am not your peer. And I'm not your piggy bank. How you talk to me does matter. So let me teach you some principles how to talk to your daddy, how to talk to your mommy. So one of the, you know, maybe you say in your home, don't you talk to mommy like that. She brought you into this world. She'd take you out. All right. So our father in heaven, holy is your name. God, I'm coming to you. I have the greatest respect for you. I come to you as a child. I'm going to sit in your lap. See, it's not the words. It's the heart. Motive matters. So here's what I want to do. I want you just to pause right now. Some of you, you thought God was far off and distant. And for you right now, this moment is for you to come to God and find your place in his lap and say, God, forgive me. I believe in Jesus by faith. Please come, your spirit, come in my life and forgive me of sin and make me new. For others of you, you believe in Jesus, but this is a powerful moment for you to reconnect in relationship. Imagine, imagine right now, you could just know that your heart was right with God. And so I don't care if you close your eyes or lay on the floor or stand to your feet, focus on a heart. Would you take a moment and just talk to God? Maybe for some of you for the very first time, you might even open your prayer with, hey, daddy in heaven, you're holy. Would you take a moment right now and would you pray? Thank you so much for joining us on our online campus. We hope that you were encouraged by today's message. We hope that so much more than just hearing one of our pastors speak, we hope 
that it was the voice of God that you heard speaking through their message. And so if today, for the very first time, you responded to the voice of God by saying yes to following Jesus, we just wanna say congratulations. We wanna say welcome home, and we would love the chance to celebrate that decision with you. So actually, right now, you can interact with one of our online campus hosts. You can do so in the comment section or by clicking on the prayer tab. Additionally, if you'd like to partner with us financially so that we can continue to share the message of Jesus with more and more people, you can do so by clicking on the Give tab or by visiting lifehousechurch.org and clicking Give. Our prayer for you is that this is a great week ahead of you as you continue to walk with the Lord and walk in community, and we hope to see you back here next weekend.